equitable, sustainable development. So we talk about, I think a lot of people mention affordable housing, um, but I, I believe that when you talk about affordable housing and you limit it to just housing, you don't um, bring into like the holistic aspect of how you look at that, which is you know building housing around where you can also catch a bus to get to work or school, or building housing that you know you don't have to pay as much for utilities or energy because it's sustainable and better for the environment. Um, but I think how you get that done is by actually engaging people. Um, you have a city right now that's its median age is 32 and a half. There's almost 100,000 college students in this city yet. In 2015, there was about 490 people between the ages of 18 and 24 that voted in local elections. Um, but I also think that's due to non-engagement. Our city councils, you know, our average is in the like 60s. That's our average voter. Um, our city doesn't do a great job at engaging us right now. But I think we're needed in this process in terms of, you know, creating what the future of tech cities actually look like um, and. I think that's very much possible. That is easy. It's housing affordability and housing choices. Um, you know, I, I work um, with um, the Wake Tech Foundation Board, and one of the things that's been really interesting to me is the number of students who are homeless. Um, you know, they they might live in a dorm, say on NC State's campus, but when school um, closes for the summer, they have no place to go. And I've worked with students at Wake Tech, for instance, who are living in their cars and you know trying to find them housing through Oak City Cares, which is an organization that um, it's a multi-service center for um, our homeless community. And we help house people and get them treatment and food and clothing and supplies, things that they need to make their lives better. Um, but I think that housing affordability um, is the biggest issue because I've seen what people are experiencing. And it's not just students, it's um, seniors. They can't afford to stay in their homes anymore. Um, but there's no place for them to go. Um, people who are graduating from school, um, they want to stay in the Raleigh area, and they have to move out to the um, you know, outskirts of Wake County. Um, people who have good jobs, um, they want to have children, they're moving to Wendell because there's communities there that they can afford and still have um, a yard, whatnot. So um, I think there are a number of things that we can do. Um, I have a 10-point plan on my website, which is um, Marianne, M-A-R-Y-A-N-N, for F-O-R-Raleigh.com. And I think that those are all the things that we can do to um, increase housing um, supply and demand, which, quite frankly, will help bring down pricing. So I think the biggest single issue, and what I'm going to stress the most in my leadership, uh, if I am mayor, is housing. Uh, like a lot of cities that are growing, Raleigh has uh, a creeping affordability crisis. And so what we need to do is to increase access to housing, both for people to rent and to buy, you know, at, at all different levels of affordability from, from very low income people, you know, people who are 20 or 30 percent of AMI to people who are, are higher up, you know, 80 to 100 percent of AMI so that they can afford an apartment but also when they're ready so that they can buy an apartment. And that's what I'm going to stress. Um, there's a lot of detail on that on my website, which is Francis for Raleigh. I talk about my plans for, uh, for housing. I do believe that, uh, you know, <laughs> and um, we were having this discussion um, last night. We had a forum uh, with the city council and all the mayor candidate, mayoral candidates. Um, I do believe uh, we are um, at a critical juncture um, as far as housing affordability. Um, one, I guess one plan or one uh, objective of mine would be to look at our rezoning uh, or zoning ordinances um, to come up with uh, new housing options uh, or housing alternatives, um, accessory development units. Um, you know, that is kind of a a new and creative approach to addressing housing affordability. Um, we need to enhance our existing housing programs. Um, you know, we need to 
uh, be able to provide the resources necessary as uh, through subsidies and um, vouchers, um, you know, to renters, low, low income renters, uh, in order to bridge that economic gap. Uh, we also need to focus on uh, credit counseling programs, um, first time home buyer assistance loans. Um, so these are all key initiatives um, that I strive to uh, execute, you know, in my first term as mayor. But yes, we do have a, a housing affordability problem. It's a crisis, it's growing. Um, it, it, anytime you have, you know, greed and profit that creeps in, um, new development, it only increases the cost of living for all. And, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose um, as far as in terms of affordability. So, yes, yes. Yes, there's an affordable housing crisis in Raleigh. Um, Raleigh's not immune to what's happening nationally around this country. Actually, Raleigh's the ninth fastest gentrifying city in this country. Um, we have an upward mobility rate about, of about 8%, which means your chances of getting to the next income level or out of poverty is pretty much close to impossible in Raleigh. Um, our affordable housing crisis is growing. We're making less units than we're losing. We're losing more units than we're making. Um, and we're, the way we're making affordable housing is, it, it really begs to ask the question who it's affordable for. Um, there's a lot of inequities in this city that when we make housing, we don't always think about people, you know, we don't, we're not really making public housing or Section 8 housing. Raleigh has less public housing than we did in 1992. We aren't prioritizing people from poverty or lower economic um, income levels, and we can be making lots of more housing, but the city needs to put in policies like increasing density and making sure that we can build up and we don't just have to always build out. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, what has happened is, I mean, it's classic uh, economics 101. Uh, uh, supply has not kept up with demand and so you know prices have risen so what we got to do is we have to create more supply and we have to come up with uh, programs that the city initiates so that uh, people will be able to afford housing so what I propose uh, one thing uh, is as soon as I'm in office I want to create a blue ribbon panel of people who know what they're talking about and go do something about the problem so developers who want to build that type of housing uh, tax lawyers and bond lawyers who are familiar with the incentives and the laws and regulations, bankers, community activists, government people, and let's just start coming up with things that we can do that will work. Uh, we're not going to solve the whole problem, but you know, I, um, you know, I like the story about the starfish. So somebody's walking along the beach, two people, all these starfish wash up on the beach. People usually think of starfish as dead, ossified creatures, but they're not. They're living creatures. And so they start picking them up and throwing them back in before they die. So I said, what are you doing? You can't save all of them. And I said, well, I just save that one. I just save that one. I just save that one. So what we want to do is just start doing things because for that one family that we get into a, an affordable, you know, decent apartment, we save that one. Uh, but there, there are lots of things that we can do. We need to uh, drastically increase the tax credit, low-income tax credit housing that we're building. That's a way of getting a subsidy to people without the people in Raleigh having to pay for the whole thing. Um, we need to zone for more density in certain areas, but make sure that density includes some affordable housing. Um, we need to build uh, more housing for homeless people, especially homeless women. There's a number of things that we talked about on the site. Well, I think Southeast Raleigh has been um, uh, uh, overlooked for a long time, and now people are, 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 are focusing on it because of you know, gentrification, which is you know, the changing of the neighborhood. At the same time, um, uh, there's been a new movement um, among like the American Association of Planners um, and other cities developing things called community benefits agreements. So how, when you are, um, uh, when you have a neighborhood that is going through a lot of change, how do you make sure the community is involved in the change, but also that there are benefits for that community that has been there historically. Um, uh, Nashville and Cincinnati and Atlanta um, have all done these community benefits agreements, but um, uh, the one I 
am really intrigued at is, uh, is um, with the Obama Library in, 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 in Chicago. They're building a community benefits agreement that makes sure that not just as, as development is happening, there's affordable housing, which is critically important, but also how do you tie in um, job training and support for small businesses and entrepreneurship for the folks that are in that area? How do you weave this all together as you're building something new to make sure that you don't leave folks behind? And how do you have really good community input in this process? It's such a slippery slope because, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you develop a, a part of town that without it, without losing that part of town? You know, there's a, there's a theory called, uh, there's a, it's called the rent gap theory. It says um, you can predict where gentrification happens and like water flows downhill, gentrification always flows in the direction of the, the cheapest property. So like right now, South Raleigh's under attack, you know, under attack. They're, they're under threat of being gentrified, you know, from downtown down towards Shaw University and then down towards MLK and over down South Saunders Street. And, you know, they want to put a stadium there. Well, that stadium would destroy all those neighborhoods. So what neighborhoods are underserved and what neighborhoods need redeveloping? I mean, let's start taking care of our people and see about, see if they can start, you know, see if they can help revitalize their own neighborhood instead of encouraging development, which will lead to gentrification. Um, so I've, I've been in Raleigh my entire life and I can very confidently say that Southeast Raleigh has always been overlooked by the city. It's a part of Raleigh that's never changed growing up. I remember, you know, as a kid, we'd go over there and, you know, there used to be this, this sneaker, not sneaker store, it was like with clothes and just different, um, it's called Moe's and it was just this like tradition of that of the community we'd go there literally like every week and then it was crazy to think that after 10 years when you know you keep going there it looked the same and we didn't think twice about it until now I'm like you know older and I'm looking at the different parts of Raleigh and I'm like there's only one part of Raleigh that we've never invested in that we've never took jobs to that we've never recruited companies to there's only one part of Raleigh that is a food desert, um, and that's Southeast Raleigh. I can't imagine, I grew up in places where if I went in a grocery store, I have about five within a mile of me. Um, but I live in Southeast Raleigh now, and there's no grocery stores. It's a, it's a food desert um, declared by the federal government. So it's just interesting to see that we live in a city where we know this, but we can ignore it um, because we have access to things like cars that we can just go to a grocery store for, or you know, we don't need to worry about it. So right now, Southeast Raleigh is not being ignored. It's the most valuable property in Raleigh right now, and it's being grabbed up by the masses. Um, so I, I think we're in a really unique and timely place in Raleigh right now. I think that I think there's a lot more um, that can be done. Um, so I, I think that we need to be more uh, welcoming to immigrants. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, proposed is that we set up an office of new Americans uh, within the city that can provide services and ombudsmanship and, and, and outreach to, uh, to people in immigrant communities, the Latino community, documented and undocumented, uh, and, and other immigrants. Um, I think that we can do more to be welcoming and open to the LGBTQ community. Um, I think also the city should have a liaison within either the city government or more specifically maybe within the Raleigh Police Department um, that, that uh, reaches out to LGBTQ people uh, to make sure that their needs are being met in the way that policing and city services are being delivered. You know, I think that a lot of this tracks along income and wealth lines, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that for um, uh, for for people of color and for LGBTQ people who are higher income and higher educated and have more resources, 
it's more welcoming. I think for those who have less money, it's less welcoming. And that you know, really gets down to more fundamental issues that I'm concerned with about you know, how we can increase more people's wealth and income. So by job creation and by housing and other city policy, um, you know, so more people can have autonomy in their life. I'm a white man. I'm a white man living in America. I've got boatloads of privilege. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on that. I've tried to be aware of that every day. I'm kind of excited that I'm the only white man in the race. That's kind of awesome. Um, you know, but we live in a, I mean, America is such a unfair place. I mean, humans are unfair beings to begin with. You know, it's not just, I mean, America's horrible, but I mean, you know, there were slaves in Egypt that built the pyramids, like in India, there's the caste system. We're not built to be naturally equal. And what I try to do is work on myself every day. And what my privilege allows is I can talk to other white people about it. Um, well, this really went off the rails fast, didn't it? <laughs> um, but as a white male, part of that privilege is I don't have to worry about being welcome because that's part of my privileges. So, you know, all I can do is I can try to be the best person I am. Yes, I think it is. I think the state has taken um, some hits lately in that. And um, I think that is tragic because our strength in this city and in this country lies in our um, diversity and welcoming all people. Um, we uh, are going to rise and fall together. And we need to understand that and, and, and build a city where everybody feels that they are welcome. So the city, our main functions are, are not related to human services or health care um, or things like that. We are more focused on roads, water, sewer, police, firefighters, um, you know, those types of services. The county um, is responsible for um, human services, mental health care, um, school funding, things of that nature. So by virtue of the fact that our governments have different functions, we don't provide those services. But having said that, I also believe that we have a role to play in, um, in providing humans, like parts of human services. I don't believe that we should be the primary lead, but I think with that for our residents, we have to lend that support. So we currently do um, have a fund that um, provides money to nonprofits who are helping um, citizens. Um, one of the things I advocated for was an automatic inflation increase um, for that fund. Um, you know, we had, I, I think it had been, um, can't, I can't remember the exact number, but there had been no increase for years. So now it increases gradually every year. But we also have ways that nonprofits can apply for funding for capital projects. Um, so for instance, Oak City Cares was one of those um, projects that the city helped fund. Um, you know, Healing Transitions is another organization that helps um, rehab um, uh, some of um, our men who are homeless who have um, addiction issues um, or other types of issues. Um, they are seeking $2 million from the city right now to help fund that facility. I am totally in favor of the city funding something like that because it impacts people who live here. I mean, we shouldn't be the primary caregiver, but we need to do our part. I do, feel, you know, for to a certain extent, um, I can say I think we can do a much better job, um, you know, as a growing municipality. Um, you know, we look at our city resources um, and how our budget is allocated towards those resources and allocating funding to the top areas of priority or the greatest need. Um, so one thing that I would uh, institute is um, a budget oversight committee 
uh, to ensure that our social programs are effective in being administrative, um, administered efficiently, um, to provide those resources uh, to our you know, underserved and uh, low income, middle income individuals, residents. Um, so one thing we do need to be is more responsive to the needs of all uh, throughout this city. Um, I'm dedicated to that and like I said, it, a lot of it resolves in our budget, our budget and spending. You know, we have to look to that, we have to look at that and kind of realign that to kind of get our priorities in order. So as of how the budget is allocated now, you don't think it serves? No, it does not. And the county does provide a lot of assistance, but I don't think they provide enough. Uh, like I talked about earlier, there's 230 men's beds at the homeless shelter. There's going to be 75 women's beds. That's 300. That's 300 beds for a for a 6,000 person homeless population. You know, I think we can do better, and I think that that's those those numbers are probably about how much across the board, the county helps, you know, people in need. And, you know, I've talked to county commissioners and they all want to help people. They all think, you know, that, that it's our job to help people, but I just don't see enough help. Um, as mayor, you know, like the, the one advantage you have as mayor is you have a, uh, you, you, you have a bully pulpit. You can talk about issues. You know, you can't change a lot. The mayor in Raleigh is a relatively powerless position. Uh, you're one of eight on a city council. You know, you have no control over the county commissioner. But you can talk about issues that make people call their city council people, and call their commissioners. Um, so, you know, I would hope that whoever the next mayor is, that they are a strong advocate for the people in need. I think they're great. Um, I, when they were um, first, um, when, every, when we first saw them in Raleigh, we didn't have rules in place, really, to govern them. And I think the major issue was enforcement of rules instead of banning them, which is essentially what has happened. Um, you know, there were a lot of people riding on sidewalks going <laughs> full speed ahead in the middle of downtown. That was not appropriate. But I really believe that if we had just enforced rules and said, hey, no, um, you know, no um, scootering on sidewalks in downtown, in the heart of downtown, you know, and we handed out tickets, people wouldn't have done it. And so the way we went about um, enforcing and creating rules, I just don't get it. And um, yes, I think bring back the scooters. I think scooters are a great option for people who want to get that last mile. You know, we talk about transit, and um, uh, you know, you got to figure out a way to get from the stop to where you're going. And I think um, scooters offer that for for some people. So yeah. I'm a fan. I think they're fun, uh, you know, but I think they are, um, they can potentially pose a, a health or no, a safety risk, uh, you know, if, you know, not uh, regulated uh, properly. Um, you know, so um, I know we've passed legislation to limit the supply of uh, electric scooters. Um, so, you know, I, I think they're an efficient means or an alternative uh, means of transportation. Um, you know, we can also look to uh, bike share programs. Um, as an alternative means of transportation. But yeah, I think uh, I, I, like, I like the concept, I like the idea. I know when I was up in DC, you know, that you, you see everybody biking to work uh, or, you know, taking an e-scooter, <laughs> electric scooter or skateboard, or, you know, just kind of getting out in the open, you know, being a very, um, you know, kind of walkable city um, and getting exercise. I tell you, I was probably much more fit up, up in DC because I walked everywhere. <laughs> so. I, yeah, I'd love to uh, kind of get back and bring some of those ideas, uh, you know, to Raleigh. Uh. So one of, I mean, it goes hand in hand with basic needs. Um, affordable housing is number one. So I would not only focus on affordable housing, but when we talk to developers and people and start making these um, partnerships on 
allotting certain percentages towards it and make sure that we have a certain percentage towards affordable housing and a certain percentage towards public housing. Um, people right now have vouchers to have housing but aren't able to get it because there aren't landlords or people accepting them right now. Um, another thing is offering and understanding that savings is a huge part of um, people being able to be financially secure. I work for a tech company um, called Even. It's a financial wellness app and it's surrounded around ending the paycheck to paycheck cycle. And um, I helped create a savings product and one of, you know, just an idea even that, you know, even right now company-wise we pitched to the city was, hey, let's have a community savings plan and let's get all these organizations and all these employers, et cetera, together and let's, you know, have community members use this product that saves well to save and then we'll get people to match it. You know, you'll get people to save and then you get them to match and people will save and you increase, that's the fastest way to increase someone's um, wealth through savings. And the city can play a role in that. Um, and then from there on is just making sure basic needs are met, understanding that there, you know, we have, we have things we haven't even dipped our toes in, i.e. like the mental health crisis. So there's a lot to do, um, but it's, I think we have all the people and the resources and potential to do it. It just, once again, just takes the right leadership and political will. I think that's a really good question. And it's going to go back to my platform, which is really focused on housing and increasing housing choices, um, better transit, um, and also support for small businesses and um, workforce development. So I'll be a little more specific with that. If we have better housing choices and people can afford to live here, we're giving them upward mobility. Second, if we're improving transit and there's more frequent bus service, we have more housing on transit lines like bus rapid transit, and if we have more housing around commuter rail, then people don't need to own a car you've automatically saved them $10,000 a year because they now have um, access to transit. And if we can um, help small businesses and our startup communities um, grow, that provides jobs. So it, it's all of the above, and that, I believe, is really the answer. Um, the other thing I really love that the city of Raleigh um, supported which the YMCA did, is a promise-built community um, that is currently um, in Southeast Raleigh. It's a, um, an elementary school connected to a YMCA, but they're also building affordable housing there, and it's beautiful. I mean, it, I drove by there today, and I was like, man, that is going to change lives because you're giving families access to education, recreation. It's on a transit line. It's close to downtown. There's so much um, in the way of opportunity there, um, but also exposure for the kids. And, you know, I really believe that exposing kids to opportunities early is um, what inspires them and helps them see what they can be. Uh, well, as far as uh, economic growth and upward mobility, you know, kind of going hand in hand, um, I do believe that the city has a responsibility uh, to increase a, or to create jobs and pathways to business ownership. Um, and right off the bat, as I mentioned this before, uh, one way would be to um, rewrite how we how we solicit, uh, you know, our uh, our goods and services uh, at the local level, um, and. Um, you know, including to include these small businesses, startups. Uh, um, I believe in local cooperatives. You know, that is another option or another another kind of key idea um, that I've uh, raised or escalated um, as far as my key initiatives. You know, where we can focus on certain communities and address those needs within that community. Um, you know, we can. I think the the strength of our economy is based on the local dollar. Uh, so when we can reinvest uh, within our community and within um, 
within Raleigh, uh, look, we all are getting a piece of the pie and we are all on that upper trajectory to achieving mobility economically, socially, and um, every, through every facet of life. So those strategies, you know, cooperatives um, and looking at how the city uh, spends on uh, goods and services, you know, especially, especially addressed to uh, small businesses. I think the way that your, your listeners and your readers should think about this is in terms of a concept called modal share, M-O-D-A-L share, or modal split. And so that refers to the percentage of people who are on different forms of transportation. So in Raleigh, the modal share of people who are on transit, which is buses, um, is very small, you know, three, four, five percent, something like that. If you take a, a, a community like Arlington, Virginia, outside of D.C., it's a third of people on that. So, you know, what we need to do is to um, improve transit and come up with strategies so over time that modal share on transit will increase. Um, over a five-year period, a 10-year period, a 20-year period. It's not going to happen overnight because uh, the bus service that we have here, the transit service we have, is not convenient enough for people all over town. And so if people have a car, they're gonna take a car because it's a more convenient way of getting around. But if you make it more convenient and make it more user-friendly and maybe make it free for everybody, I mean, it doesn't make that much money anyway from ridership, they make it free for everyone, perhaps, um, then over time, I think we can increase that motor share on transit. Well, you know, the most, the, the, the most successful transit um, uh, lines that we have in the county is, is, is y'all. It's the Wolf Line. The Wolf Line brings more people in and out, moves more people in public transit than any other mode. So y'all are actually doing it here in, in, at NC State. In 2016, we developed the Wake County Transit Plan. That's getting built out now. It's about $2.3 billion over the next 10 years. And there are three pieces to it. There's expanding bus frequency and coverage, right? This is a county system. So expanding coverage all over the county. Some of those lines, most of those lines are gonna be 30 minutes or an hour each, especially all over the county. But then also making more frequent lines where there are more people, right? Because if you offer buses more frequently, more people will ride them. You have to, it is one of those, if you, if you build it, they have to come situations. Yeah. So we'll go from 17 miles of, of, of service with 15 minute headways to 89. So substantially increasing that. That's the bus. Then there's the commuter rail. And that is an existing track that the state of North Carolina actually owns a railroad. And um, they have to do some improvements on the track, but that's where it will go. And it will start at the Johnston County line and go to Garner, um, Hammond Road, Raleigh Union Station, NC State, you'll get a stop, um, and uh, Morrisville, Cary, and it'll end up in the um, Wake County side of the RTP. So, um, and they'll go 30 minutes headway. So it, that's mostly for the people that are going to and from Durham and to work every day. Right? Mm -hmm. And the third piece is bus rapid transit, which is, um, like a, it, it, it's a fast bus. They're nice buses. They're elevated um, uh, entryways. It feels more like a subway station than a bus station. They're bigger stations. You have fare cards. You don't have coin boxes. And they don't stop. So they have dedicated lanes and they go fast. Um, the first route that, that uh, is getting built out is New Bern Avenue from downtown Union Station um, all the way out um, past the Belt Line into Nightdale. So um, that's getting done and then making sure that there are connections, as I talked about that last mile, that it's safe to walk and bike um, uh, after you get to your stop to connect it and making sure that those connections are good. The other lines in BRT go out western into Cary, which also affects y'all at, at state. So y'all are going to have lots of options here in the future as this plan gets built out. And then down to Garner and then up um, a little past Old Wake Forest Road to the north. And how do you intend on supporting that? Um, 
it's already getting supported. There's a half cent sales tax that's been levied. And so that's the funding that's going to go to the expanding of transit. Well, I mean, I'm afraid at this point it's more or less impossible. Um, you know, uh, traditionally transportation like bus, the, like the bus hub is located downtown. Um, and the reason you do that is because traditionally there were a lot of blue, blue collar people who needed to use transportation who lived around a city center. Well, as the city center turns from a blue collar neighborhood into a rich neighborhood, the people who need services like transportation and other, other similar um, social services, they get pushed out into the suburbs. Uh, this is the, right now is the first time in American history that there's more poor and near poor. Like I say, poor is zero to poverty level, near poor is poverty level, to twice poverty level. This is the first time in U.S. history that poor and near poor people, more of them have lived in the suburbs than have lived in the city center. And the further you fan out, the harder it is to get your bus transportation to everyone. You know, when, when like I live by North Hills Mall, and there's a bus stop at North Hills Mall, but I live eight miles north of downtown, and I live a mile down into a neighborhood. So if I want to use the bus, I've got to walk a mile to a bus stop. Now that's, that's not really accessible, but it would cost so much to take that bus to go up to North Hills and then go all through the neighborhoods and provide bus service to everybody. And then if you expand that to all of Raleigh, I mean, it's a huge problem. Um, another problem with transportation is wherever you run bus lines, gentrification, gentrification tends to happen. Um, I mean, you can absolutely destroy a neighborhood by giving it great transportation. Um, and again, I'm going back to like, you know, how we as a city mistreat the poor. But, you know, so, so our bus system is lacking because we're so sprawled out and we don't, take care of the neighborhoods that we do run bus stations to. So what we do is we get little pockets of gentrification along bus lines. And then the places that are transportation droughts remain, you know, remain poor.